All right, I have that it's uh, just noon. And if you just joined us, people are sharing uh, their names and where they're from as far as county or if they're with a Master Gardener group or another organization, feel free to share that in the chat box. Um, some housekeeping items we have today are, um, if you're new to Zoom or haven't used it very much, uh, at the bottom of your screen, if you just hover your mouse over it, there's a mute and unmute button. Um, for the sake of, of kind of helping our speaker today, we're gonna keep it on mute. Um, if you have a question or um, comment, you can leave that in the chat box. Um, and then when we um, go over that question, if, if you need to chime in, um, feel free to unmute yourself and do that at that time. But we will probably keep you on mute throughout the program. Um, there's also a stop and start video button right beside that. So feel free to um, you know, start your video or, or stop it at any time as well. And that just shows um, your face on the screen there for everyone to see. Um, and then the chat feature is right there in the middle on that bottom bar. So um, if you uh, have a question, like I said earlier, you can just put it in um, the chat box and we will um, get to you uh, periodically throughout, throughout the program. We'll stop our speaker and, and have him interact then. Um, and one other place you can stop and start your mute or mute and unmute yourself and change your video is on your actual um, screen there. So where you look where you, you can see your own face or see your name, there's three dots and you can stop and start your video and mute yourself and unmute yourself there. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We have Mark Kepler and um, I'll let him tell you a little about himself and his role here in Extension. He's going to be talking about fruit tree management today. So take it away, Mark. So I've been in Extension for a few years and I've had the opportunity to talk to a variety of people about their fruit trees. And um, I am a person who is normally from a small farm, um, livestock farm that I grew up on. And one of the things I'm going to refer to today is the fact that as part of my youth growing up, uh, we were associated with an apple farm. I didn't actually go out there and work at that apple farm, but I've been around that apple farm for a long, long period of time. And today, uh, I still am. So my whole entire life has been around this one farm somewhat. And, and I've had the opportunity to talk with, with the gentleman who used to own that apple orchard from time to time. And we talk about some of the history and some of the past. And so we'll get into those as we get into this today. I start out this presentation with a slide that's not around Indiana. If you look at the background there, you'll see those hills back there. I assume this picture comes from Washington. I've stole it off the internet somewhere along the line. But I want you to look at that apple production that's going on there and, and take a look at that. And when I go to this orchard that I used to go to as a child, dad used to put this 
tree, um, up into the tree, a great big wide ladder that way, way up in the tree and people had to go up there and pick their apples. And we called those standard size trees. Well, if you look at this orchard here, these are not standard size trees. They're dwarfs or semi dwarfs in that area that we're looking at. The other thing about this is we see very good weed control and we see watering systems out there on this, this big expanse of apple orchard. And another thing is you'll notice the rolling ground somewhat. So I'll get into talking about all those different things as we go along here today. So I'm going to come at this program today from the standpoint that I have made this decision in my life that I want to plant a fruit tree. I'm not really sure which tree I'm going to plant, but I know I want to plant a fruit tree. So the first slide I got is this in here, and it talks about the hardiness of a tree. That is its ability to withstand the cold temperatures in the wintertime. And as you look at these here, you'll see that an apple tree is the most hardiest one there is of the bunch. As a matter of fact, when I was talking to the old apple grower, uh, and he was 90 some years old, we were sitting out there and he said, you know, you see that tree over there, that apple tree? That tree has been in there ever since I was born. So that tree lived for many more years after that. I do not believe that tree is still here. And this was 20 some years ago. Uh, I do not believe that tree is still here because the orchard has been let go and then just grown up all around it. So the point being, an apple tree has the potential to live 100 years. Uh, and those standard sized trees would always do that. On down that list is a pear tree. In a pear tree, I'll get 40, maybe 50 years out of a pear tree. Uh, cherry tree, I get down into having some issues with, with cold weather. And a cherry tree will maybe give me 30 to 40. Plum down in the 20s to 30. And a peach tree uh, is something that is very, very susceptible to cold temperatures. And you get the right cold temperatures in the wintertime, will actually kill a peach tree totally out. Um, and then there are other times that we get late frost or frost coming on that will kill the peach bloom. So I tell people, if you're going to grow a peach tree, you may get 15 years out of that tree. But at the same time, you may only get a few peach crops because of those cold weathers that come along. So I have a lot of take homes I like to do during these presentations. And one of the things I always like to talk about is that take home of hardiness. If a peach tree dies from a cold weather, when do I usually see that peach tree die? And people think, well, you know, in the spring sometime. But the reality of it is lots of trees that die from cold end up dying in the middle of summertime. And that's because that tree has a layer underneath the bark called the cambium layer. And that cambium layer is what reproduces that next annual ring for that tree. And when that annual ring dies and the tree still has water flowing up and down it still has leaves and buds on it still has all those functions going on but what ends up happening is the tree cannot produce that next annual ring and because it cannot produce that next annual ring it just wilts down and dies in the middle of summer the key there is the wilt in our world we get to look at lots of diseased plants if we see some kind of a leaf that's got spots all over it uh, it's maybe a little bit of an issue, it may be a, uh, a deadly issue, but most of the time it is not. In the tree world, it's when the leaves wilt and hang on, that's when we know we've got an issue uh, with that plant, and that plant's got some serious problems going on with it. So just from a hardiness standpoint, you would probably come to the conclusion that we want to grow an apple tree, and most people do. Uh, and, and that's why I put up this slide, because the next slide tells us which are the easiest to take care of? Bottom of the list, hardest tree in the world to take care of is that apple tree. It is a very difficult tree to take care of. There are lots of insects and diseases that we have on apple trees. And so if you would go back to that commercial orchard that we saw on the first slide that was there, I would guarantee you that orchard probably gets sprayed about 12 times a year with fungicides and insecticides and maybe other types of things it would need just to take care of that, that fruit that's on there. So uh, apple trees are extremely hard to take care of. Flip side of that is a pear tree. You can grow a pear tree without ever 
pretty much spraying it. Yes, there are some issues. One's called fire blight that we get into pears that can actually kill the tree. But on our farm growing up, we had a pear tree and we would have a fairly good pears to eat every year without doing any kind of spraying or any kind of work whatsoever to it. So even though apple trees are probably the hardest thing to take care of and within the apple, there are certain varieties that are even harder to take care of. We're gonna to have to go ahead and I'm gonna talk apples from here on out because that's what most people will end up planting in their yard is those apple trees. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the size of the tree. So that orchard that I grew up with were standard size trees. And again, they have to put the big ladders up there. In the old days, they had to stand out there with a sprayer on a boom and just shoot it way up into the tree in order to get coverage of our tree sprays at that time. And those are the standard trees and they get to be about 20, 25 feet tall. They're not huge trees, they're not oak trees, but they are fairly good sized trees and you have a risk getting up into them to go ahead and pick them. Then there are semi-dwarf trees and then mostly what we're seeing nowadays are the dwarfs. And one of the interesting things about a dwarf tree is they actually bear fruit earlier. Uh, they start having at four years of age, you'll start seeing some fruit on them and, and you'll see that production come on a lot earlier. So one of the things you have to make a decision of when you go to buy that tree is what size tree that I'm gonna get. One of the problems I have an issue with is when you go to a big box store to buy this fruit tree, you don't have a lot of the information that I'm gonna talk about today. You may not even say what it's a dwarf, semi-dwarf or standard on the tag. It may just tell you the variety and that's it. And that's really not telling you a lot, but it's telling you a few things. So um, you have to make that decision then when you go to buy an apple, what's your favorite variety of apple? And the world is full of different kind of apple varieties out there. Uh, some of them like the uh, Red Delicious has been around since the 1800s. And there are newer varieties coming on all the time. Uh, and if we think of um, uh, some of the newer varieties that are out there now that people are enjoying, we find that uh, they're, they're very popular. Uh, in, in our areas. And so those may be examples of different varieties of apples that you may want to take a look at. And there's a whole lot more than that. So I pick on my Granny Smith apple here. Um, and that's a very popular variety. And it's a very old variety. Old Granny Smith lived in Australia in 1850. And, and I don't know the story, but I can make up my own version of this uh, as it goes. But I assume that old granny had a good old apple tree growing there on her property somewhere. And people would come around and people would say, you know, granny, I, I, I just really like the taste of your apple there. I'd like to have a Granny Smith apple tree for myself. <clears throat> so my question to you, and to you to think about, is if I take that seed that I see in this slide right here, and I take that seed and I take it out and I plant it in the ground and I plant that seed from that Granny Smith apple tree, do I get a Granny Smith apple tree? Now that's a question. Will I get a Granny Smith apple tree? And the answer to that is eh, something kind of similar. Because that, that seed that's in that apple, half its genetics came from Granny. The other half of the genetics of that seed came from wherever that bumblebee or that honeybee or whatever kind of bee it might have been around, went out somewhere and collected the pollen from another fruit tree. Generally, it could be an apple tree, crab apple tree. Um, and so it brought over the genetics and put it into that seed. And so if I plant that seed in the ground, I'm gonna have something like a Granny Smith but I'm not gonna have a Granny Smith apple tree. It'll be in that area. But the world is full of Granny Smith apple trees and they're everywhere and we can see them in a lot of different places. Uh, so how do we get Granny Smith apple trees if we can't plant the seed and get Granny Smith apple trees? Well, the answer to that is grafting. And, and it's, and it's it, every single Granny Smith apple that we have out there today all came from that original tree. And from that tree, they took cuttings off of it. And those cuttings then were grafted onto a little fruit tree that was growing in the ground and growing up 
And so they grafted on it. It was about a pencil size or maybe a little bigger. They did that graft to it. There is only one Granny Smith apple tree in this whole world that this started out from, and that genetics is from that one apple. Let me go backwards. There was only one Braeburn tree. There was only one Cortland tree. There was only one Fuji tree. And what they did was take cuttings after cuttings after cuttings and propagate these different ones until we got all the apple varieties we've got around the world. And so that is how uh, we get all these different apples. And so when you go to plant an apple that's got a name brand on it, you're going back to the original genetics and you're going back to something that was from a cutting, from a cutting of a cutting of a cutting on down the line of that original tree to begin with that we're looking at. So if I'm growing this tree in my, uh, in my yard, and, and this is a really good picture and a good slide to take a look at. I'm gonna use my cursor. I think you can see it here. There at the bottom of here is what we call the rootstock. The rootstock is whatever we're grafting it onto. And there are named rootstocks. And some rootstocks will do better in clay soils. Some will do better in sandy soils. Some will do better in northern Indiana where I'm at. Other ones will do better down in Georgia. There are all different rootstocks that are around the world. Um, and they all do better in different areas. So the, the scion at the top would be the Granny Smith that's been pushed upon this. And so they cut off this this uh, uh, rootstock and grafted the granny on there. And that's where that big swelling is at. That's the graft union that's right there. So that's how we get most of our apple trees. Notice right off to the side, there's a big fence post setting right there. That big fence post is there because in grafted trees, as you can imagine, that graft union is a very weak area. And so sometimes they take these dwarf trees and they will tie them over or tie them to a, a fence post or some kind of a structure to keep them from breaking off in the winds like we had last night that could have done something like that. So a good example of what we're dealing with here as far as that, that root section goes, and that's a graft. And that down part down below is the rootstock. That rootstock, like I said, you have to know which one. Um, and the rootstock is what makes the tree dwarf. Granny Smith's original apple tree growing in her yard would have been a standard sized tree. But by grafting that to a rootstock that dwarfs it, that keeps it small, that rootstock then is what keeps that fruit tree of yours small. Now, one of the things you got to talk about is they don't really like the fact that you cut them off and stuck another tree on top of them. And, and because they don't like that, in this slide I talk about suckers. That's the sprouts coming up out of the ground and from that area because it's trying to grow itself. And one of our objects that we have to do is keep those suckers around the base of the plant trimmed back. And otherwise the suckers will just come up and take over and the top of the, the tree will just be uh, useless essentially. I remember in our area, we had a crab apple tree that had white and red blooms on it. And if you followed it down, um, one of them, I can't remember which, one came out from below the graft that was white and the one that came out above the grass was red or vice versa. But it, it was uh, an issue with that graft. People did not keep the suckers pruned off and so it took off and growed. Uh, same thing I've seen in roses. If you get rose varieties that are grafted and they die back, some people say, well, I bought this rose. It's supposed to be a, a peach color and it's white. Well, chances are the graft has died and the lower part has taken over and taken off is what's going on with that. So we need to protect that graft from mice and rabbits. So let me go back to that slide. Whoops, going the wrong way. Go back to that slide again. And let's say it's the winter time and we've got some kind of a varmint out here that's going to eat it. Let's say the snow is at the low level right here where we got that rootstock uh, going on right in this area here. If a rabbit comes out and chews that all the way off, what has happened to our tree? He, they have killed the scion. They have killed it from there on up. Girdling it around the branch will take that right out. And so we have killed that scion off of there and that's the end of that tree. If the rabbit came up here and girdled it with a lot of snow on the ground and girdled it higher and a bud kind of sprouted out the side and came on up off that side, then we can still keep our tree. 
So sometimes we're a little quick to cut trees down in this youth stage when some damage has happened to them. Wait to see if the buds start up, but make sure you know where those buds are at, above the graft or below the graft. It really, really does make a difference. So the other thing that I always like to talk about if we're thinking about buying a tree or getting a tree is ones that are resistant to diseases. Um, Genetic resistance is always the best option for uh, diseases. And we have this disease I'll talk about a little bit later called apple scab. And apple scab is a fungus disease like most plants get are fungus diseases. And it comes into the apple and it causes the leaves to turn yellow and fall off. And it also affects the fruit itself and getting spots on the fruit. Um, and so apple scab is, is a really important disease that, that if we can just buy a variety that is resistant to apple scab, we can cut out some of those sprayings that we've talked about earlier. And, and I'll get into the spray thing a little bit later on. But this is some examples of apple varieties <clears throat> that were created through, uh, I believe, Cornell and Purdue, and I believe Illinois was the other one that ended up putting together these different varieties of apples that have a resistance to apple scab, that disease. And so as a homeowner, I think you should strongly look at some of these different varieties. Gold Rush, I've had those apples, a very late maturing apple. In fact, these are listed in their order of maturity. And, and um, it's a really good apple. It's best picked about the time the snow starts flying with the Gold Rush. So if you're wondering about these, I'm going to give you a publication a little bit where you can find this information at that we're talking about today. But you might want to try some of these apples on your own to see if you really, really like those different varieties of apples. And this is the publication uh, that Purdue University has. It's called Managing Pest and Home Fruit Planting. And anytime somebody walks in my door and brings me an apple, and with all sorts of issues associated with it, this is where I go right here to this publication because this is what they need to have if they're going to be successful in fruit growing. Starting out early in extension, people would bring me in an apple and they'd say to me, what's wrong with this? And I said, well, you got uh, this disease or this insect. And I, then I would ask, did you spray? And they say, well, yeah, I did spray. And I'm going, gee, I don't know what's going on. Well, I have learned that spraying is different for different people. And like I said earlier, if you're really into commercial apple production, you're spraying that tree 12 times a year. And for those individuals, they may have only put one or two sprays on it. And that is not what it takes to do to home fruit plantings. So you can look up this, you can do a Google search on this. Uh, I always do Purdue home fruit and this publication comes up. This is a little older version of it. It actually does show you on this area right here, it shows you actual pictures of what these different developmental stages of are. This is an apple, this is dormant, silver tip, green tip, and it gives you all these different stages because there are different sprays put on at different stages for this publication. And as you go through it, it will name those scab resistant varieties we talked about earlier. And it also will give you a chart later on about what sprays you need and what time you need to put them on. To be very successful in apple production, there's a lot of chemicals involved in it. And even though there are organic apples that you can buy at the grocery store, the vast majority of them are raised out in that Washington area where they don't get the diseases and bugs like we do. And although I've got a grower right here in Fulton County that does organic apples, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and you have a lot to learn before you can go down that road. So that's a great publication. It lists a lot of different things in there for you. One of the things it'll talk about for a, for a fungicide or an insecticide is what they call a multi-purpose fruit spray. And what we really have on, an, on a tree, we have insect problems and we have disease problems. Multi-purpose has a fungicide for the disease and an insecticide for the insects all right there in the same package. The normal fungicide we util utilize in orchards is captan. That's a very common fungicide. We've used it for years. It helps with apple scab. There's some other diseases out there that are less prevalent, but around 
and it helps out. <clears throat> Seven is an insecticide. It's an old insecticide. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it here in a minute. Malathion is also an old insecticide uh, that's available. There are newer insecticides that are coming along. And some of these newer insecticides contain a chemical called spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. -I, I call it spinosad. Uh, newer chemical, more organic in nature, that also does control some of the fly populations. And we'll talk about flies. So uh, these insecticides are not the most effective. Commercial growers have a lot better products that are available to them for killing bugs. And the insecticides are very, very low. Um, one of the things I don't like about this mixture is I'm spraying a fungicide and an insecticide. And when you take a look at the charts in that publication, until that apple is about ready to develop for the first few sprays of the year, you don't need an insecticide. You need a fungicide on there. And so I sure don't want to be spraying an insecticide when that tree is in full bloom because that's when I'm going to kill my honeybees. I don't want to be doing that. So putting Captan, the fungicide, on about three times before that tree starts to form apples is what we have to do to help us prevent apple scab during that time period. So, um, and if you only got a couple trees, these multi-purpose fruit sprays are okay. If you've got six, seven, ten trees out there, you may want to buy the, the components separately. It'll be a lot cheaper to do it that way because it gets really expensive. So here's that seven I talked about. And I think it's important. We in Extension try to tell people to follow label directions. Follow label directions. So I go to the garden center. I pick up this jug of seven. And it kills over 100 listed insects. Yes, I'm going to get them. I'm going to kill them on vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals. And so I throw that in my mixture. If I don't read the label, a little bit further down the label, it says, note, to avoid undesirable apple fitting, delay use until at least 30 days after full bloom. If I throw and spray seven on an apple tree with little tiny apples on it, it will drop every one of those apples or almost every one of those apples off the tree. So it's important to understand that. When I look back at that multi-purpose fruit spray, it had a little bit of seven in it. Uh, it didn't have a lot. Well, I could add more seven into that after I get past that 30 days because that is the time that I am going to want to go, uh, to go ahead and, and really start worrying about some of them bugs getting into my apples anyway, that seven will be more effective. That's why it's important to read those labels. Otherwise, I could just thin the whole bunch off my tree. Let's talk about pollination. Most fruit trees are self-incompatible. That means they really can't pollinate themselves very well, and they need another pollinator, some other variety out there to pollinate them. And so some of them are flat out sterile. They just can't pollinate anything, or they can't be that pollinator themselves. So if you go to that commercial orchard, you're going to see about 10 trees in a row that are one variety, and then there's going to be a different variety called the pollinator at the end. That variety may not produce very good apples. Uh, it may not be something they want to keep. Those apples may end up being in cider along the line, but they won't be a named variety like a Jonathan or a Golden Delicious or something like that, but they'll just be there for that pollination. Uh, that's, that's the whole reason why they're there is that one. Uh, and... Um, so when it pollinates, understand, all it does is pollinate the seed. That pollinator doesn't change anything about that apple. That apple is still a, a honeydew or a honey, a honey crisp. It's still a honey crisp. Uh, and the seed inside of it, though, is not a honey crisp. But we don't care about that. We're not eating the seed. So the apple itself is that way. And so the pollinators, all they do was help to pollinate that seed that's in there. And then the apple forms around, the fruit of the apple forms around that seed. So I don't want to be using any insecticides also at pollination time as we go through that. Now the next thing is, I'll go back to that original slide we were looking at. I want to plant my tree where there's good air movement. And if you think about that original slide, there's no forest or woodland around. Way off in the distance were some hills and big hills over there. But we like to have air movement. 
we have to have air movement for really two things. One is diseases. If I can get the air to move, those leaves will dry out from the heavy morning dew or from the rain a lot faster. And if I can get those leaves to dry out faster, those fungus diseases can infect as bad. So that's why we have it. The second thing is frost. If I can get those trees up in the hill, up in that area, there's less frost up high. The frost really concentrates in the low areas. And if you ever walk into a low area on, a, on that morning, when it's really full sun, no wind, and you walk down into an area, it is very, very cold. The, I've had the cold just hit me in the face. So top or side of the hill is what we wanna have. We wanna have well-drained, none of these fruit trees at all like to have wet feet, especially apples, do not like to have their roots wet. And so we got to have good drainage and that hillside will probably give you some of that good drainage as well as the, as maybe we need to maybe help the drainage out somewhat. And the other thing is full sun. I always talk about fruits, trees as chemical manufacturing facilities. They take the products of sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and manufacture them into that sweet tasting fruit that we have there. In order to do that, they have to have full sun. If we limit the sun, then we're gonna limit the production of that, that tree. So those people that are out there who live in town, uh, I, where you've got houses around and yard trees around, that is the main limitation we're looking at is full sun, also, we don't really have good air movement either. So we've got more disease problems, and this is always true in town than we do out in the country. So we want full sun and good air movement, and that's hard to get sometimes in a town lot. When I plant the tree, I usually get it as either a bare root, if I've ordered it from somewhere. That means all the dirt's gone and there's bare roots there, and we need to make sure they stay moist. And we plant that early in the spring, eh, March, late March, early April, probably early April sometime. We plant it in a hole that's wide, but not deep. If we dig a hole deep, then as I put that tree in it and put the dirt back around, it'll settle and it'll settle down. And down is not something we want because we never want trees growing deeper than what they were to begin. Any tree, fruit tree or any kind of tree. We never want them to be growing deeper than what they were in nature. And, and another thing I always like to tell people, don't put that nice, beautiful black dirt that you got from the garden store back in that hole. Put the same old dirt right back in the hole that you got. It is going to have to learn to live in that environment. And all you do with that nice black dirt put in there is you end up causing the roots to grow around in circles inside and not break out of that hole. Watch it when you dig that hole too. Make sure you don't have smooth sides on it because that's just like a clay pot if it's in a heavy soil and it's hard for them roots to get through there. So try not to make have the soil too wet so that you smooth the sides of that soil. You want it to be dry enough that you have that going on with that. So the no amendments to it. Mark, Good picture. Mark, we do have one yep. question. It's back yep. when we were talking about the air movement. Mm -hmm. How do you go about thinning your apples? Okay. So um, apple fitting is, is, uh, uh, is something that needs to be done. I mean, you really wanted to get right down to it. The apple needs to be about one apple per every six inches. It's on that branch. And so when you've got that, the one thing I seen somebody do a long time ago is they just took a, um, a broomstick, put a hunk of foot or so, a hose on the end of that broomstick, and just reached up there with a broomstick and physically knocked off some of those apples up there by doing it, and that was their way of thinning it. You could use that seven if you knew what you were doing, but you gotta know what you're doing to do that. So I always tell people it's just a hand thing, take a broomstick with that, that, that rubber hose on it, reach up there and just knock that thing and try to tap them off there. That's the best way. Last year I had an apple tree in my yard that, that just absolutely had tremendous amounts of apples. And when anytime people say, well, I got lots of apples, but they were small, that's because they're, that's all that tree can handle. The sunlight that was hitting the leaves couldn't make them apples any bigger because there was way too many apples on that tree, okay? The other thing is, uh, getting back to this here, you see 
this planted in this hole. Actually, I'd make that hole a little bit wider than that than a bare rooted plant. And even if you get a plant that's already potted, make the hole a little bit wider than that and break it up some. But see where that graft is at? That graft has to be above the ground. If I put that graft below the ground, first off, it's planted too deep and in the long run, this tree ain't gonna do good. And the second thing is, it'll just send sprouts right out the side and it'll root itself right off that graft. And so the dwarf part is gone. Um, and that tree will just take off and end up growing on you. So that, that is important to do that. So that's a, a good point right there. Fertilizing. If, uh, when you put a tree into the ground, I would really like to know what the pH of that soil was to begin with. And, and that can only be done through a soil test. And soil tests are really important things to do. And an apple tree and fruit trees in general like a soil that's a little on the acid side. That means the pH is from a six to a six and a half. If I was growing grass, it would like to be a little bit better than that, but I'm not growing grass, I'm growing an apple tree there. So that's the ideal range. When I put that tree in the ground, I can use something like a triple 12 fertilizer. Uh, and I can use that for one pound for every age of that tree up to 12 pounds of uh, fertilizer up to 12 years of age. You don't necessarily always need to have fertilizer on trees. Trees don't need fertilize like flowers and grasses and those types of things. Trees um, sometimes don't need fertilized at all, depending on the environment they're in. And I have down there, so they may need none. Um, and, and you've got to understand the, the, the psychology of a plant. Okay, we got a real winner here. He's going to talk about plant psychology. And I do like to talk about plant psychology. What's a plant's goal in life? And that goal in life is to reproduce the species. So if it's growing and doing fine, it's got plenty of fertilizer and the sunlight and everything just wonderful and marvelous and doing well, it may decide, well, I'll just put out an apple or maybe two apples this year or three. I, I, the world is great. I don't need to reproduce because those apples that I throw out there will probably hit that fertile soil and do just fine. And so you don't want to put the fertilizer to an apple tree. It's good to get them started and get them going, but putting a lot of fertilizer on a tree or a fruit tree like that, they may get that thinking in their mind that, um, that they really don't have to reproduce. And my common example of that is a tomato plant. You put nitrogen on a tomato plant and it will just grow like crazy and it'll throw out a few fruit, but not very much at all. So all you got is green foliage and a few red apples on it. So with an apple tree, you don't really want to, to get them too over fertilized. In the old days, those commercial apple guys like I used to deal with, he would come up to an apple tree that isn't producing well, whip out his pocket knife, gouge it underneath so he hits that cambium layer of the tree and cuts a little bit around that tree and shocks that tree into thinking, oh my gosh, I'm dying, I need to reproduce my species, and boom, it would start putting on apples. So it, it is, uh, uh, so don't, don't get into the fertilization too far down the line. Uh, it may not need it at all. Control the weeds. Uh, they compete for the water, they compete for the nutrients. I get better tree growth. That original slide I looked at had weed control all around it. I increases my fruit size. And then there's this thing called a vole. And a vole is, is like a mouse, but it's not really the mouse that we think of as a house mouse. It really goes out and it goes underneath the snow. And as it goes under the snow, it'll come up to a fruit tree like that. And it will girdle it and eat the bark right off of it. And moles don't like to be seen. They want to be hidden because the hawk is going to get me if it sees me. So it stays under the mulch. It stays under the, where the weeds are at. So one of the things I always talk about for vole control is you've got to pull the mulch back a little bit from the trunk of the tree. And you don't want to have weeds growing in that area where voles can get in there. They're kind of the silent killers sometimes. And we get to see the results of vole damage quite a bit in our jobs. And most people aren't suspecting what's going on out there with moles. In fact, uh, so keep it clean around the drip line. The drip line is the end of the branches down. So if I had it 
the tree wanted it its way, if it wanted to do its life like it'd like to have, it wouldn't have any grass out there at all. So by taking it out least of the drip line, I am giving it some less competition from that grass. Uh, but the, the true tree would like to go farther than that. Weed whackers, man, they will rip up the bark. If you get in there, underneath that bark is that cambium layer. That's the life of that tree. It'll get into some problems. And Roundup herbicide, we have a tendency to use that a lot around trees, and that's fine. But if a little sprout is coming off the side and there's some tree growing there, little little tree part growing there, you get Roundup on that, it'll go into that tree and it'll be there for years and years. And it'll cause issues on that tree for a long time. Don't till, that rips up tree roots, little fine hair tree roots, don't do that. I've got mulch, I think that's the best thing to do. Pull it back from the trunk a little bit. These things are called rodent guards. I got this picture of one like this. This is a, uh, a deciduous tree of some kind growing out in a pasture. It just prevents those voles from getting to it, those little screened in areas like that. Quarter inch hardware cloth would do the same thing. Uh, that we're looking at here would really help it out or even smaller than quarter inch hardware cloth would help it out by doing that. This is the toughest thing there is and that's pruning. People get so hung up on pruning and I have seen this so many years and there are all different methods of pruning. Now a fruit tree needs to be pruned for production. A tree growing in my yard, a maple, an oak, they don't need to be pruned for production. We don't want to produce as most maple seeds as we can do or the most acorns as possible. They don't need to be done that way, but fruit trees need to be pruned for our production purposes. And the thing you got to understand is you need to think sunlight. Going back to that whole premise, it's a chemical manufacturing facility that we've got here. That's what we've got to deal with. And so we think sunlight. So the first mark simple rule to pruning, all right? Just think sunlight. Any branches that go up, go up or in, come off. Any branches that overlap and rub, come, come off. Any branches, and any branches that overlap, so we're one hand and my other hand. And if you take a look at my hands here, this one here is getting shaded by this one. One of those need to go. I don't know which one, you have to make the decision but you have to figure out which one that need to go. So if I do up and in, overlap and rub, prune them off. By the time I get done doing that, I have probably pruned a third of that tree out of there. And that's no more than you ever want to prune out of a fruit tree. That's enough. So that is the key to pruning. There are all different methods out there. People will give you all different ideas, but just make it simple. Don't get confused by all that. Just keep it simple. And, and that's the rules that I, I look at for pruning of fruit trees. Here's an ideal apple tree, big and wide at the bottom, narrow at the top, sunlight penetrating. The branches are well spaced apart. The branches at the bottom are your first year, then you get a, a flurry of second year growth and third year growth as you go up that, that, that um, uh, picture there, you have different years growth. And the other thing is, it's got good branch angles. Trees need 90 degree angles. They don't like 30 degree narrow angles like this. Got to get my camera. Narrow angles like this. They want angles like this, 90 degrees. These kind like this split out easy. These are the strong angles. So at the top of that tree, and we're out right up here at the top, if I can get my cursor right there, I have a, a narrow angle. And so what they will do in commercial production is they'll get something, I lost it, they'll get something to spread that out so that angle will get wider. It's more of a 90 degree rather than that's a 45 probably. That is a stronger angle at 90 than at 45. And so they'll put a, a couple of uh, sticks, even a clothespin stuck between it and spread it. So they call them spreaders. Lots of times in commercial orchards, you'll see a two by two with a nail pounded in at each end, ground off so there's spikes on each end and just stick that nail or that board in between them and pull them down. That's what we're doing with that. That's an ideal shape for a tree. When I do pruning cuts, I never like to cut branches off in the middle of them. I always cut branches down at the ends of them. 
Anytime you cut them like this, you end up getting a haircut and you get all this frilliness to it, which doesn't give you very good sunlight penetration. Down here, if I want to take this branch, I might cut this one off right here. That's how I thin it. And see, I cut it clear back to the branch is where I cut it back to. You cut a smaller branch back to a bigger branch. That's the idea. Small branch back to a big, bigger branch. That's a thinning cut. When do I do this? March. End of February, March. Excellent time to be doing that. That's the time of year that we ought to be pruning any kind of a tree that we want to prune, uh, especially fruit trees come into that time period. Uh, but March will work out extremely well. Let's talk about the buds. On a tree, we have flower buds and we have leaf buds. And all these buds are formed the year before. So out there on that tree right now, it has the leaf buds and the flower buds formed for next year. And so when wintertime comes, the leaves drop off, those buds are already there, ready to come on next year. So when winter kill comes along on something like a peach tree, especially apple trees rarely ever see winter kill of flower buds. But on a peach tree, the winter kill comes along, it is killing off those flower buds. And nothing, I, I just never see uh, leaf buds get killed. What ends up hurting leaf buds is after they, they form and are starting to grow in the spring and you get a really late frost, that's what will burn them. And a frost for a fruit tree, especially apple trees, is 28 degrees. It's not 32. It takes 28 degrees. So that term frost, I could get in a whole discussion on what frost means. But essentially, yeah, uh, an apple if they put them in cold storage, they're below 32. So they can handle those temperatures a little bit colder than 32 degrees. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about this disease called apple scab. And it's a fungus disease. It likes cool, wet weather. What do we have this spring? We had cool, wet weather. That's the main time it likes to infect. And it'll get on the leaves and on the fruit and it'll cause those leaves to eventually turn yellow and all summer long, you're going to have leaves starting to drop off of it. You'll see more and more trees fall off. On the fruit, it'll, I'll show you a picture of what it can do to it. But understand, this is a fungus, and they float around as spores. And these spores just float in the air. When people have allergies, they have mold allergies. We're talking about fungal spores floating around in the air. And they land on this leaf when it's wet. And they germinate just like a seed and they germinate and they go into that leaf and they puncture it right in there with fungal hyphae. Uh, and that's how they get into that plant leaf. It's depending on the temperature and the time. We have rains in the spring of the year we call scab rains. And what a scab rain is, is a rain that is the right time and the right temperature and it's going to infect and that's what it'll do. So one of the things I need to do is use a fungicide. This is a thing that people get wrong. When do I spray a fungicide? When I'm putting Captan on, Captan doesn't cure anything. Captan prevents. So I spray Captan fungicide before the rain to protect that leaf during the rain. My classic example is if you have a bulletproof vest, do you put it on before you get shot or after you get shot? bad example, but it's the same kind of a thing. The bulletproof vest is the fungicide, and you put it on before somebody starts shooting. Uh, that's what you do. Afterwards, it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. So all fungicides are like that. Uh, all fungicides, almost all, are preventative in nature, and commercial guys have got some that actually can cure, but ours are mostly preventative in nature. Well, that's what scab looks like on an apple. Doesn't look too tasty. That's what it looks like on the leaf. See how it doesn't have just a spot? It's kind of got an area. And that area turns black like that and it eventually turns yellow and that leaf will fall off there. First thing I want to do for apple scab is go back to that publication ID 146 and make sure I get a variety that's resistant to apple scab. That'll help. Sanitation, rake the leaves and use fungicides at the right time. It'll tell you in that publication when to use those. Then we got bugs. Apple maggot is probably the number one bug that we see in, in well, we don't see it. <laughs> it's there, but we don't see it. That's the interesting thing about apple maggot. It's a fly, it's a maggot. 
That means it's a legless uh, insect. The, uh, the fly lays an egg, it hatches into a maggot, and that maggot just burrows under the, into that apple and just makes tunnels going right through that apple. And those tunnels then produce brown streaks in that apple. Um, and and, and um, so those apples then will have kind of a bumpy feeling on the outside of them. And these apple maggots, they come in of June and July, June, July, August, kind of later in the year. So I can use my seven insecticide on this because I've already had the apples form and generally I'm 30 days past. So it will work very well on these apple maggots. So with that spinosa that I talked about too. But I only talk about those brown streaks because if you bite into an apple in the fall, you're not gonna find an apple maggot. They're gone. But the streaks they leave behind is where they've ate it in one end and squirted it out the other, and they have caused that damage to that apple that's happened there. So that's what you see when you see an apple maggots that are on there. Uh, if they're really bad, they can cause the tree to drop drop um, uh, apples early on. That could be that June time period. So apple maggots are something that's really important to watch for, and this is why we spray. There's damage. It's not the greatest picture in the world, but you can see brown brown areas of that apple. You can see it's almost, look at the, if you felt that, you could feel the bumps on the outside where the apple maggots had come into there and had done some damage to that. So what's the cure for it? I always talk about hogs in the orchard. If I go back to the old guys, they used to run animals in the orchard and the animals were out there for sanitation. Now, most of us are not gonna be running hogs in our orchard these days, but the concept is it's sanitation. This happens to be a picture at Michigan State was doing for organic fruit production where they were running hogs in the orchard so, so they could clean up and sanitize. So if that apple has fallen off and it's got a bug in it, that hog just took care of it right there. And so that way we're trying to reduce the number of, of insects. So when guys used to run sheep and geese and hogs in the orchard, those are things that cause sanitation. And that's what we would do for sanitation. Uh, I got the spinosa there, I got the seven there. One of the concepts that came out was organic. Let's put these red sticky apples into the tree, attract those apple maggots and stick them to it by that fly tape kind of a thing. Well, Purdue actually did research on that and found that you attracted more apple maggots into the tree and caused more damage by those red sticky apples. So we really don't recommend utilizing those things. Another one we have, it's an issue, is called a coddling moth. This is the one that I talked to about, and, and it, it's a non-native moth. It lays an egg, the egg hatches out to a nice big worm, and when you pick that apple off the ground, it's fallen in the fall of the year, and you bite into it and you find a worm, that's a coddling moth. So what's worse than finding a worm? Finding half a worm. But anyway, we won't get into that. Um, so this coddling moth larva, is in that apple um, and it's in the core of that apple, burrows in the side and into the core. And I'll show you a picture here in a minute. It spends the winter under loose bark around the tree and cracks in the soil and fence post in the area. It comes on late in the year and that's why we see it in that apple. And this is what it looks like and we've seen it before. We've all seen it, that's a coddling moth. See how it's come out the side, burrowed down the center, that's exactly what we normally find. There are all sorts of, of insect frass or manure that's in the inside there. And, and that is really caused uh, a lot of damage to that apple. And I don't think um, most of us want to eat that thing when it looks like that. That's a coddling moth. Hogs in the orchard. A lot of those apples fall to the ground. And if they are picked up by something, by sanitation, in other words, we get them out of there and remove them, we, we get rid of those um, those coddling moths. So I don't think anything's going to run hogs, but the whole idea is sanitation, sanitation. Get rid of them. One of the organic control methods that came out was using cardboard strips. You know, I said this worm likes to crawl and spend the winter under the bark. Well, now nice corrugated cardboard wrapped around that tree. Oh, that's just a great place to be. We'll just crawl in there and spend the winter. And then you just come along and you take the cardboard board off the tree and go take it and dispose of it. And you've taken care of that, that, that issue with those worms. Fruit sprays and seven also will take care of that coddling moth. Last one on the list is a pum cucurio. Tough word to pronounce, cucurio, but cucurios are beetles with snouts. They got snouts sticking out 
And the plum curio will take that snout and feed on young fruit. Uh, and it also has a way of cutting what we call a crescent shaped um, underneath into it and lays its eggs in that crescent shape in that apple. So it will cause fruit drop. As a matter of fact, if the fruit doesn't drop, the plum curio will die. It's been laid in there. It has to drop because if the fruit keeps forming, it'll crush that plum curio. So if you see um, this snouted beetle that I have here on the left, it makes those little crescent shapes in here that we're talking about on the right. And that's the damage. And later on, here's another picture of it again. Some damage there. See these scars? That is where the plum curio has caused damage, laid its egg in an apple, but the apple ended up growing and didn't fall off the tree and it ended up crushing it. So some little plum curio lost his life inside of that apple right there when I see those scabs like that. And not scabs, I shouldn't call it that because apple scabs different. Those little marks on the tree like that. By the way, when I look at this, I also see all these little specks over here. All those specks, it's called fly speck, and it's not from a fly, it is a disease. So we get those coming on late in the year. We get sooty blotch and fly speck. Sooty blotch is a blackish area, and the fly specks are actual little specks like this. And um, so we, uh, it's kind of a late season. The fungicides would help clear that up, but that's the reason why you shine an apple lots of times. They'll just take those things and take them right off of there because that shininess on there. So that's a plum cochilio. Uh, Multi-purpose fruit sprays and seven insecticide are the things that we take a look at. All right, well, that is my slide set. I've been through lots of stuff. We went fairly fast and done a variety of things here today. So Krista, I'd be looking to see what kind of questions that you ended up getting here uh, so we can go through some questions from different people. All right, well, I'm not Krista, but I will, uh... Uh, go ahead and ask a couple questions that we've got here. So, all right. uh, Patty asks, should you wait till June to drop to thin? So, yeah, you've got to wait till those little apples form on there so you can tell what's going on. So, uh, well, the fruit tree I got at home right now, I told you that it just bared like crazy last year. Just absolutely all these little tiny apples on it. Well, it's a what we call a biennial bearer. I cannot find one apple on that tree this year. It bears every other year. And there's a lot, I talked to somebody the other day who was gonna cut a tree down because it wasn't barren. Well, that's the nature of that variety. It, it bears every other year. So when I go out there in June, I'm gonna look at that tree and say to myself, well, we had that late frost. It pretty well thinned most of this tree anyway. So sometimes a late frost is a good thing. Or I'll look at that, so, but I gotta have little apples on there to thin them and I need to thin them as soon as I can start seeing them coming on. Okay. And we are also supposed to remind you that it's not dirt, it's soil. We had that comment from a couple people, so. Well, you know, depends what's on your shoes or not. But you know what I always like to say when I say that comment, I, I have people put all this fancy soil back in there and I just try to tell them to pay, put the same old crappy dirt back in there it came out. And I think they understand that very well. In other words, you don't have to do fancy things to it. All right, another comment or another question that came in uh, from Joan is, which fruit trees tolerate black walnut? So apple trees, uh, so what we do there is um, we go to a publication that answers those things. And so Purdue has a publication on that. Other universities have publications on that. And so I always go to those publications and I read on there what tolerates black walnuts. Now, I know my apple does, but I would always have to refer to that publication. What amazes me about those publications is the Iowa State one may say that you can't plant this one in this spot and the Indiana one says you can plant it. So there is a definite regional differences uh, in some of the thinkings on there. But uh, there are a variety of fruits like raspberry that don't do well around walnuts, but uh, I, I'd have to go directly to that publication and go through all those different ones. But it's out there and it's available. Purdue definitely has one. So 
black walnut toxicity Purdue. That's what I would Google because the black walnut puts out toxins in the roots that inhibit the growth of some plants and flat kill others. And those black walnuts will kill tomato plants. Absolutely no problem at all with that. But there are other things that can, that can withstand them. That's all the questions that are in the chat box right now. So. I've shared that publication there in the chat box. So if you're interested in finding, reading more about that uh, black walnut toxicity, it's, it's right there in that link. My yard has, I think, nine walnut trees in it. So um, I didn't plant any of them. They're just something I inherited. And uh, they're nice, big trees, and I, I have to plant around them because of that to toxicity. And every once in a while, I plant something, and then later on, I think, gee, I should have checked. And, uh, and, and I should have checked <laughs> because it wasn't good. Anything else, Krista? Matthias? I guess a question for my own personal uh, knowledge here is in my yard here, uh, my son wanted an apple tree here uh, during COVID. So we went to the grocery store, not to the grocery store, but to the box store and purchased uh, Jonathan. And we have a crab apple tree in the yard within 15 feet of it. Is that enough to uh, pollinate that tree when the time comes? So I'll give you the yes, no, maybe answer to that. Uh, it, yes, it is enough. That's all it takes to do that. But when you do pollination, you have to watch pollination times. Some trees pollinate late, some trees pollinate early. Those summer varieties of apples, lots of times, they are something that pollinates early. That uh, um, uh, honey crisp is something that pollinates late. So what you wanna do is have something that pollinates around the same time as the one you have. And you, pay, you, will, you probably will never know the answer to that until they start, start blooming at the same time. Uh, and that'll be your answer to it. But I'll guarantee you, that you can go a good quarter, half mile away. There's, if you think about a honeybee, they'll go two miles. So if there's something around, you're gonna get pollinated. It doesn't take much. My pear tree was the only one I knew of for a half mile, mile around, and it always got pollinated. Well, that's good, because there is an apple orchard within two, three miles of my house, so that yeah, should be, I, yeah, should be I, Honeybees easily travel two miles and a lot more than that. Well, anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you tuning in today. Um, again, uh, I am in Fulton County. If you got any kind of uh, questions, uh, I pass them along and we'll be happy to help you out.